Jonathan Pollard, competition lawyer, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Let's talk about mediation, folks. In virtually every civil or commercial case being litigated in America today, the parties will ultimately be ordered to attend mediation. I don't care whether it's state court, I don't care whether it's federal court, I don't care whether there's $10,000 at issue or $10 million at issue. Mandatory court-ordered mediation is now part of the litigation process. I'm not a mediator. I don't make money performing mediations. I'm simply here to provide my recommendations on how you can utilize mediation to your benefit. Quite often, it's a waste of time and it's a waste of money, but it doesn't have to be if you do it the right way. <clears throat> Number one, let's talk about the settlement culture and the court system's embrace of mediation. It's not just that the litigation process is being pushed away from being adversarial, pushed away from gloves off, knockdown, drag out, trial, all the marbles toward, hey, everybody you know, come together and sort of resolve the dispute. Yes, culturally it's being pushed away from that, but there are also structural reasons why courts funnel everybody toward mediation. It's because the courts are simply overrun and overburdened. The federal courts to a lesser extent than the state courts. But if you look at state court systems throughout the country, and particularly in Florida, you have judges who have a thousand plus cases on their docket. And at that point, it simply becomes unworkable. It is entirely unrealistic for us to expect that a single state court judge is going to be able to preside over a thousand cases and give each of those cases a sort of thorough, thoughtful consideration that the parties expect and that the parties are looking for. So, you know, the answer there is, is obviously in, in places like Florida and other state court systems where the, the courts are overwhelmed and the judges have massive dockets, we have to do a better job of funding the court system. And if you're a lawyer or a law firm and you're up in arms over a $100 or a $200 increase to your bar dues, which would go to fund you know, more judges, more law clerks, more staff attorneys, more resources to lessen the burden on the state court systems. If you're up in arms over that, paying another $100 or $200 a year in dues to have a system that is more fair, more equitable, more efficient, less overburdened, go find another profession, okay? You don't belong in this one. But that's why we're set up the way we are and why courts are funneling everybody toward mediation and in fact toward mandatory mediation. So in any civil or commercial dispute, you will ultimately be obligated to attend mediation at least once. And if you take an appeal in the federal court system, you will most likely be required to attend appellate mediation. So you're back in mandatory mediation again. If, if you're forced to go to mediation, then you might as well make the best of it and try to use mediation as a tool that can help you advance your case or if you're an attorney to advance your client's case. So what's the first thing you can do? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to pick the right mediator. I've mediated, I, I can't even begin to count. I've mediated dozens, if not more than a hundred cases at this point in my career. And I can tell you that the vast majority of mediators out there, in my opinion, are woefully ineffective. If you just pick a mediator off of the rack or off of the list, you know, who you don't know, sight unseen, aren't familiar with the person's track record, aren't familiar with their resume, somebody throws out a name and you say, okay, yeah, we'll agree to Charlie. Charlie can mediate. Terrible idea, okay? You're just, it's a recipe for disaster. If you're going to be ordered to go to mediation, you have to spend some time on the front end making a thoughtful decision about who is the right mediator 
for that particular case. Now, you might have mediators who you've dealt with at a certain time in your career, and you might say, oh, you know, Joe's a, a, a good mediator. Well, the, the problem there is the right mediator for one case is not the right mediator for another case. So in selecting a mediator, what you're really looking for is, number one, you're looking for subject matter expertise. If it's a trade secret case, you want somebody who's litigated ideally both sides of trade secret cases. If it's a non-compete case, same thing. You want somebody who's seen both sides of the case. What you don't want to do is get somebody who's only seen one side of the case or only litigated one side of the case, and so their entire framework and wheelhouse exists on that side of the V, and they've never seen the other side, never really considered the other side because they've never litigated it from that direction. You want somebody with substantive and significant experience on both sides. And I'm not just talking, oh, I litigated two or three cases like that. You often see mediators you know, who will tell you, oh yeah, I, I, I litigated a couple of those cases. I'm, I'm familiar with that area of law. Nonsense, shenanigans, right? People don't truly become familiar with an area of law to the extent or degree of having subject matter expertise where they can step into a room, assess both sides of it, and then go to the relevant parties or litigants and say, hey, look, here's what I think your risk is, here's what I think your exposure is, here's what I think your weak spots are, and here's why I think you need to come to the table. They're not gonna be able to do that if they've just litigated two or three cases in a particular wheelhouse. I'm talking about having litigated 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 of a certain type of case over many years. That's the kind of subject matter expertise you're looking for. That's number one. Number two, you're looking for somebody who ideally has experience throughout the entirety of the litigation process. There are a whole lot of attorneys out there who have made a career off of either you know, filing a complaint and then settling a case or litigating the first sort of one third to one half of a case. There are far fewer attorneys out there who have actually seen the litigation process the entire way through. And I mean summary judgment, pre-trial statements, motions in limine, trial, post-trial briefs, post-trial appeals. You're looking for somebody who has seen the entire process. Why? Well, because somebody who has seen the entire process will be able to provide a more objective perspective to the lawyers and litigants in the room. You, you'll often get into mediation where you, know, you have one side claiming a zillion dollars in damages because it's a fake number that they pulled out of thin air and they just wanna put a big dollar amount on the case. I've been in so many cases, non-compete cases, trade secret cases, where the plaintiff is out there throwing around two million, five million, ten million, twenty million dollars, and these are just this is just funny money. It's it's a number that they have pulled out of thin air, and they have no actual evidence to substantiate these dollar amounts. It's literally they just picked a big number, and that's what they're saying they want. The problem is if you get into mediation with a mediator who one, does not have subject matter expertise, but two, has not seen the process through, the, you know, the entire scope of the litigation process, this is the sort of mediator who's gonna see 15 or $20 million on the front end and say, well, they're seeking a huge number from you. I cannot begin to count the number of mediators who operate that way. Why? Because they've never actually tried a darn case. So they have no understanding of damages. They have no understanding of what's admissible versus what will necessarily be excluded at trial. So that's why it's so important on the front end, you have to pick a qualified mediator. Another uh, consideration in terms of picking a mediator, you want to avoid mediators who are desperate to settle the case. Okay. There are certain mediators who for them, their, their number one goal is to settle the case at all costs. And it doesn't matter whether or not it's a good resolution, a fair resolution, whether it works for you, whether it works for them, they just want to get the case settled. Because to them, 
not settling the case is losing and settling the case is a win and another notch on their belt so they can go out there and they can say, oh yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've mediated and resolved, oh, countless cases. Like, I did, in fact, I just did one. It was very contentious, many millions of dollars. You know, we were, we were able to get it done, right? They just want to put that notch on their belt, okay? Avoid mediators who will push you to settle at all costs. A deal, right? You don't take a deal just because it's a deal. You take a deal at mediation because it makes sense based on the facts, based on the law, based on the risk, based on the exposure, based on your willingness to try the case, based on your resources, based on a dozen or more different factors. You don't simply take a deal because a deal is on the table. And invariably, you will go to mediation. If you do this long enough and you litigate enough cases, you go to enough mediations, you will go to a mediation where it breaks down, the other side is being obstinate, and the mediator is pushing on you to simply accept their universe and, and, and make a deal, right? So let's look at it like this. Let, let's say this is the, the football field right here, okay? You're over here, the, uh, call them the plaintiff, they're over here, right? You're the defendant, you're over here, plaintiff is over here, right? You're, you're willing to move sort of right in about here, and you know, plaintiff's willing to move right in about here, and you're willing to come to here, plaintiff's still not willing to budge. Okay, at this point, the mediator is forcing you to come over to their universe. Don't bite on it. And don't hire a mediator who cares more about getting you to make that leap and take that deal rather than cares about getting the parties to sort of, you know, come to somewhere in the middle. Okay, so first things first, you've got to select the right mediator. That's, that's you know, 90% of the action right there. If you select the bad mediator, if you select the wrong mediator, case is going nowhere in a hurry, okay? And in fact, selecting the wrong mediator can actually have significant downside consequences. You might think to yourself, well, it's just mediation, right? We go into mediation, we don't make a deal, you know, whatever. We just, you know, keep sort of moving forward. It is what it is. Wrong. Why? If you pick the wrong mediator who doesn't understand the law, especially if he's a mediator who comes primarily out of the other side's universe, and, you know, say it's a, say it's a non-compete case or a trade secret case, your client's being sued for $15 million in a big trade secret case, and you pick a mediator, and the mediator is primarily sort of a big firm, you know, corporate management side lawyer, and he comes into mediation, and he immediately bites on and adopts their wheelhouse. So he's now talking to you and your client from the paradigm of, you know, this $15 million, this is real, okay? You know, you need to come to the table and, and you need to come to like 10 to 12 to get rid of this because my God, you have massive exposure. Never mind the fact that the plaintiff has not even identified its trade secrets with the necessary degree of specificity, let alone put in any evidence of legally cognizable damages. But that's how mediation can backfire. You get the wrong mediator, and now the other side leaves mediation, and they're emboldened because the mediator basically signed off on their side of the case. That's why it is so critically important to spend some time on the front end selecting the right mediator. Number two, take mediation seriously and put some time into it, okay? If you're gonna go into mediation, you should sit down before mediation and you should put together a mediation statement. You can send a mediation statement solely to the mediator if you wanna make it confidential and if you wanna map out what your concerns are and you know, what you perceive as your downside risks, I don't recommend that, you can do it, I don't recommend it. Instead, I recommend you do a mediation statement where you lay out the facts of the case, your case theory, your case law, your evidence, you put that in writing, and I recommend that you send it in advance of mediation to everyone. You send it to the mediator and you send it to opposing counsel. Why? Because this way, you are giving them a five page, case summary in advance of mediation. They can sit down, digest it, go through it, talk it over with their clients, or they can throw it in the trash, right? But either way, you are giving them 
a concise summary of your case theory in advance of mediation so that if they're going to take this thing seriously, the other side can sit down with their decision makers and talk through it in advance of mediation. Okay, so you can, like I said, you can do one that, you know, blows it out and tells the mediator, you know, what your concerns are, but I don't recommend you do that unless it's a mediator who you have used multiple times in the past and who you can 100% unequivocally trust with that information. So that's what you do in advance of mediation. Now let's go to the day of mediation when you get there, okay? And this is, this is absolutely critical, people. In many mediations, the other side will show up, and especially if they have a weak case and if the lawyer has not been particularly forthcoming with their client on the other side, that lawyer on the other side will want to skip opening statements. Don't do it. That's a negatory. Don't do it. Never agree to skip opening statements. I do not care how contentious the case is. I do not care if the mediator says, ah, opening statements, you know, somebody might walk away. No, do your opening statement. Prepare an opening statement, take it seriously, and make it absolutely lethal and surgical. You can do a PowerPoint presentation, you can lay out the facts, you can lay out the case law, you can cite to the jury instructions, you can cite documents that have been produced in the record by Bates numbers, you can cite exhibits, blow it out. Do a mediation presentation, preferably do it via PowerPoint. We do that all the time. I consider it wildly effective. Why? Let me explain. In many instances, okay, uh, and I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this, people, okay? I, I, I'm not here to sort of pat every lawyer in the profession on the back and say, oh, all lawyers are wonderful lawyers and wonderful people and everybody's 100% on the up and up. That's just not true, okay? There are good lawyers and bad lawyers. There are good teachers and bad teachers. Good cops, bad cops. It's just like human beings. There are good people, there are bad people. That's how the world is, okay? One thing that I have observed time and time again in litigation is that there are certain lawyers who do not fully convey settlement communications to their clients because they don't want their clients to see, to read, to hear directly from the other side. So if I'm in a case and I send a settlement communication early in the litigation where I'll send a three or four page letter early in the case that says, Here's the facts, here's the law, here's our position, here's our demand, here's what we perceive your risk to be, you know, here's what we'll settle for. I send those types of correspondences early in the litigation uh, for a variety of reasons, which we can get into in other discussions. But I send a settlement correspondence and I often find myself wondering, did the party on the other side ever actually see that? Because it's one thing if in my settlement communication, which is three or four pages long, and I lay it all out and support it all, and then I say I want $750,000, that's one thing. It's quite a different story if the lawyer on the other side just goes to her client and says, Pollard wants $750,000. I know, I know he's crazy. You know, we should just reject this. And the client on the other side obviously says, $750,000, my God, this guy is an absolute idiot. Yeah, we're, of course we're not accepting seven hundred fifty, dollars but, the client on the other side never actually saw the sort of full blown out settlement demand where I go through everything and explain exactly why we're getting to that number, how we got there, what our evidence is. So I think that happens with a shocking degree of regularity. And so to that end, you have to use mediation to overcome that. Think of it this way, folks. Mediation is your best and sometimes your only opportunity to speak directly to the decision maker on the other side, short of trial. And at trial, it's more complicated because there are many more actors in the room and you're speaking to the jury, you're speaking to the judge. This is the first, the best, and sometimes the only opportunity to speak directly to the party on the other side directly to the person on the other side making the decision. And I don't care whether it's the CEO of a privately owned company or whether it's the insurance adjuster or whoever it is on the other side, you have the opportunity 
to go into that room and to present your case directly to them. And so it often happens that the lawyer on the other side, especially if they have the weak case, especially if they have not conveyed all of your settlement correspondence, communications, demands to their client, especially if they have not properly advise their client with respect to their client's risk and exposure in the litigation. Those types of lawyers will attempt to prevent you from doing an opening statement. And when they do that, you say no and you demand to be heard and to do your opening statement. Because now you're going to be able to get in the other side's ear, not through their lawyer, not through a filter, not through the lawyer's lens where you know he can move stuff around and sort of translate it for his client. No, 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 no. You're gonna be able to go directly to the client. So do your pre-mediation statement, circulate that around to the parties and the lawyers, you know, to, to the lawyers and the mediator, and then do your mediation presentation and do not take no for an answer. Because what'll often happen is you insist upon doing openings. The lawyer on the other side wanted to skip them. And so it goes something like this. The lawyer on the other side gets up and says, well, you know, we weren't going to do openings, but um, I'll, I'll make a little, little presentation here. Um, you know, we, we have evidence that uh, Bob stole our trade secrets, our valuable uh, customer information and customer lists. Um, these are highly proprietary. Um, and we know that Bob has been uh, soliciting those customers using our proprietary uh, trade secrets, which are, by the way, highly confidential. And we are now uh, getting reports that um, he, uh, he also stole uh, additional uh, trade secret information from us, which we cannot yet identify, but we will, uh, we will, we were, we're getting some more rumors and reports in the market that he stole even more than we thought. And so for this reason, uh, we're seeking $17 million uh, in damages and we can prove this and we're also going to seek punitive damages. So we're, we're here, um, you know, in good faith to mediate, but, you know, Bob has to understand that, you know, if he doesn't, you know, take this as his opportunity, um, you know, he, it's going to be really big problems for Bob. You know, that's our opening, right? You, you see that kind of opening all the time. Why? Because the people don't really have a case and they haven't actually taken the time and effort to prepare anything. And so once that lawyer does their opening and it's like two minutes long of just trash, generic allegations, no support, no foundation, no actual law, just, you know, we think you stole a bunch of stuff and you owe us $17 million. You'll see that time and time again because they're unprepared. They also have no case. And so they sit down, you know, they're, they're done with their opening and then you get up and you do a 25 minute full blown PowerPoint presentation with like 27 slides where you go through all the facts, the evidence, the case law, their exposure, they're gonna leave the room. You're gonna break out into your sort of separate rooms, whether in person or virtually, and I guarantee you the party on the other side, the decision maker in the other room is going to be having a panic attack, absolute freak out, breakdown, meltdown. They are going to be livid. And now they're gonna start asking their lawyer, well, are, are you really sure, right? Because I listened to your presentation, then I listened to their presentation, and it seems like, you know, they've got a bunch of facts and they've got a bunch of law and like they know what they're talking about. And now at this point, what's going to happen is the lawyer on the other side, and I'm, look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to be so vicious about this, but like, look, th this is what I do, okay? This is what I do and I'm just telling you how it's done, okay? Um, because I'm in favor of whichever side is right, okay? The side that is on the side of what is right, what is fair, what is just, right? That's what I want to prevail. And, you know, more often than not, in the type of cases that I litigate, this sort of not compete trade secret unfair competition, I see so many frivolous and, and bad faith and just bogus cases filed against folks. And so 
what I'm, what I'm giving you is useful universally on any side of, of the ledger or the equation, but it's particularly useful in the defense of non-compete, trade secret, unfair competition cases. And so back to the action, right? So you're in mediation, the, uh, the party on the other side has had an absolute meltdown, and now they're in a situation where the lawyer on the other side is scrambling to reassure the client in the other room that, no, 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 we, we have a real case and, and, and we have evidence and they're, they're all liars and, and you know, they're, they're just trying to trick you and scare you, but like, you know, trust me, like I, I know what I'm doing. And so at this point, um, the lawyer on the other side is, is gonna start throwing out sort of allegations and, 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 and supposed facts and evidence that they think supports their case. Because the mediator, once you do it like this, right, the mediator's not coming into my room, all right? I just threw it down, I did a 25 minute opening presentation and basically like handed you your hat on a plate, okay? The mediator's not coming to talk to me. The mediator's coming to talk to you, okay? Because he knows you got a problem and you better come to Jesus right quick. So the mediator goes into your room, okay? And the mediator's in you know, your room, not you, but the mediator's in the other room. And the mediator's like, um, all right, well, let's, let's talk about this, okay? And so the first thing that happens is the lawyer who has basically just been shellacked, caught by surprise, totally un unprepared, that lawyer starts, you know, throwing out whatever cards he has, right? He starts throwing them on the table, thinking that he's got something, you know, to prove that the other side, which is you or me or whoever just did this sort of big dog mediation presentation by the book, the way I'm recommending it, um, the lawyer on the other side, the one that's just been shellacked, he says, well, no, 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 we have, we have, we have evidence I have evidence. I can prove that they're liars. I can prove that they stole our biggest client. Okay, fine, prove it, prove it, right? This is when you get a good mediator, okay? Good mediator is gonna say, what client did they steal, okay? Okay, they, they stole, stole client A, okay? When did they steal them, okay? They stole client A in December, okay? How much, how much revenue was that, uh, okay? $10 million, okay. Let me, and after he confers with them for, 25, 30, 45 minutes, right? Depending on sort of how much of a cluster it is and how complex it is. He's gonna come back into your room and he's gonna say, well, you know, they disagree with your version of facts. And so there's a couple sort of big, big ticket items here we gotta go through, okay? And so the first thing we gotta talk about is, you know, client that you stole, $10 million client you stole in December. Ah, well, prepare, right? Be prepared for mediation. This is why it's so important for you to put some time in in advance of mediation and get your ducks in a row. Why? Because it's gonna give you an opportunity to blow up the other side's case. This is what they perceive to be their smoking gun. And so the whole time, the lawyer on the other side has been pushing this narrative of you stole their biggest client, you stole the client in December, and it was $10 million in, in revenue that they lost. And that's what they're building the entire case on. Well, if you do your homework and you prepare for mediation and treat it as a possible breaking point, you've got the evidence right there. You got the case file, you have the documents, you already have the stuff highlighted, you have it pulled, you have it arranged, and you're able to hand the mediator a document. You're able to say, Mr. Mediator, um, that's completely inaccurate. Um, here, you look at this document right here. Um, that client terminated the other side in December, and it wasn't until April that we submitted a bid and proposal for that business, and we were awarded that business in June. So this notion of we stole their biggest client in December that's hogwash. They were fired by their biggest client in December. And then in an open competitive bidding process with six other possible vendors, we were the best bid and we were selected and we were awarded it in June. So you take this back to them in the other room and you tell them they better come to Jesus and they better recognize that they are not entitled to their own set of facts, right? You do that, right? You go through a couple iterations of that, you will be in a mediation, right? If you get the right mediator and if you prepare for it, you will go through that two or three or four times. And every time when that mediator, when you are able to send that mediator back to the other side, okay, back to the other room, and 
each piece of nonsense that lawyer throws at you, you are able to prove that it's exactly that, that it's bogus, that it's nonsense, and that it's not real, that it's fabricated, that it's concocted, and that that lawyer is delusional. You do that three or four times in a row, all of a sudden, the party in the other room, the decision maker in the other room, is they're in a, in a downward spiral, right? Because now they're coming to the realization that their lawyer has been pushing this bogus, delusional narrative of the case, the facts, the law, and it's all starting to come crashing down around them. You will be in, in cases where, I, I kid you not, and I'm not, you know, I can't, you know, get into specific case examples uh, because of confidentiality and related concerns, but I will tell you um, from having seen this so many times and sort of practiced in this space for so long and seen so much litigation and mediation, etc., you will see cases where the party on the other side, call them the plaintiff, the corporate plaintiff, is demanding $6 million, okay? You'll go to a mediation, you're the right mediator and you prepared the right way and you do it, right? pre-mediation statement, opening mediation presentation, you're prepared, you got all your evidence, all the key documents, the supposed smoking guns, whatever you need to rebut their claims, um, and you go back and forth a couple rounds, you will be in a situation where the other side starts off, you know, their, their pre-mediation stance is they want $6 million. You will be in a situation where you can get cases like that done for $250,000, right? The absolute collapse of the supposed case value by $5.75 million within a span of five hours. You, you can do that, right? But in order for you to do that, you have to put in the legwork. So another caveat, um, another point about the actual mediation day and I touched upon this earlier in the discussion, but it is, it is very significant. Do not allow a mediator to roll you, okay? Don't. Like I said, certain mediators, their primary motivation is to get any deal. Not a good deal. Not a deal you like, not a deal they like, not a deal anybody likes. Not a deal that's fair, not a deal that's right, not a deal that's, that makes sense. They just want to get a deal. They don't care how much of a trash deal it is, as long as it's a deal, then they can consider it a victory. Another successful day at the office, honey, right? That doesn't serve you, and that doesn't serve your clients. Now, I know that America at large, and sort of in litigation, is, is now a settlement culture, right? I mean, when you look at the number of cases that will actually go to trial, take for instance, the uh, Southern District of Florida, where I practice routinely, United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida, something like less than half a percent of all commercial cases filed will ever see a jury trial. That's because everybody taps out. But you have to remember, okay, that settlement at any cost is not the appropriate paradigm. And I, I think there are a lot of folks in, in, in litigation, um, so whether they're, they're lawyers or, or litigants or parties or what have you, or mediators, there's a lot of folks in litigation whose paradigm is basically get into the case, rabble, 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 settle. Get into the case, rabble, 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 settle, right? And you have to understand that that's, that's the wrong paradigm. Because if you get into the case with the intention of just sort of play fighting for a little while and then settling, you're not really thinking about the case from a long-term perspective. You're not looking at the case from a perspective of trial. You're not looking at the case with regard to what you need to ultimately prove at the end of the day. One of the greatest things I learned at Boyce Schiller and Flexner, and I learned 
countless things there and I worked with brilliant attorneys and it was an amazing place to start my career. But one of the things that I always remember that I was taught very early in, in my career as a lawyer was that immediately after filing the case or even before filing the case, just very early on in the litigation, you need to study the operative jury instructions and you need to build your case strategy. You need to build the evidence, the record, the theory, the discovery plan, all of that needs to be built around what the jury instructions say. Because if it's a jury trial, the jury instructions are the holy grail. The jury instructions will tell you how it's ultimately going to go down, what you ultimately need to prove in order to win your case. So, you know, you wanna look at those jury instructions you want to look at those jury instructions early in the case. But, you know, in, in America today, back to the point, sorry to go off on a tangent, um, everything is going to funnel towards settlement, especially mediation, because mediation is a sort of settlement mechanism, right? It's the highway. It's the off-ramp. You know, here, here's litigation highway. Here's the off-ramp to mediation. There you go, folks. Mediation. Settle your case. Don't get rolled. Do not let a mediator force you or your clients into a bad deal. You cannot have this existential crisis over the prospect of not resolving the case at mediation. You cannot have this panic and fear over, you know, what do you do next or, or what about trial, right? Like, no, they, 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 the process goes on. Oftentimes I see people um, either on the brink of taking a bad deal or actually taking a bad deal or a terrible deal or a deal with even worse, lingering exposure, a deal where there are still strings, ties, restrictions, connections, obligations, where, you know, the deal can come back and sort of really bite them in the rear end. No, a bad deal, um, at any cost, that, that is not a viable paradigm. So you can't just go into these things with we're gonna settle at any cost. And you have to, on the front end, you have to prevail upon your client um, to let your client know and understand, look, we are not going in here desperate to make a deal. Because if you're desperate to make a deal and you're not willing to go, um, you make a bad deal and bad things happen. Jonathan Pollard, competition lawyer, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I know this has been a very long conversation about mediation, but I think if you utilize some of these tips and techniques the next go round, I think you will find that they are incredibly valuable. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.